So there's a point to us having driver behaviours. Oh, a yeah. Survival they're mechanism. defences. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're defences. Yeah. But like all the other defences we have psychologically, they're very, very important because without these psychological defence systems, we'd have to then really feel the pain, the trauma, you know, the difficulties and hurts from our childhood. Yeah. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. So welcome back to the next episode. We're on episode 63 with me, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Bob Cook. And we're going to follow on from the earlier two podcast episodes that we've done. We're looking at all five driver behaviours. And we've done Be Perfect, and we did Try Hard. So this week, we're going to be looking at Be Strong, Another one that's close to my heart, Bob. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, since we did the last one, in a, the last podcast on drivers, I'm thinking, I've got two dogs, um, Charles Cavaliers, and I was thinking about driver behaviour with the dogs. You know, Interesting. Being strong and being perfect and trying hard and please me. I'm sure there's a friend of mine who's uh, a dog therapist, and I haven't got to ask her yet, but I'm sure they have the they have behaviour behavioral drivers as well my dog's definitely a please others or a please me 100 yeah, yeah, yeah. percent. yeah well charles cavaliers are famous for pleasing and pleasing others especially yeah. around food y- yes yeah. <laughs> yeah mine just follows me around everywhere <laughs> we're getting back to human people human um, people human beings yeah, so do you want to give a quick synopsis on drivers for the people who didn't leave, listen to the last two uh, podcasts? I will do, I will do. Drivers is connected with our life script and formed early on in life, probably before the age of seven, even earlier, where we got recognition and validation and praise from our parents for displaying certain personality traits, whether that's being strong or pleasing them or trying really hard or whatever it is. So that then becomes part of our, I always say part of our DNA or our genetic makeup, but it's not really in our DNA. It's just part of who we become as adults. And we tend to replay that in our relationships every day, but it all goes back to earlier decisions that we made. And I think that's an important point, Bob. It's earlier decisions that we made we made the decision to do it. So what I often say is that we can make a new decision if it's not working for us. Yeah, and I think that's very important. And secondly, very important, they're linked to injunctions. Yes. That's very, very important. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Or Yeah, well, the, the, the injunctions, do we refer to those as counter scripts or something? Those okay. are all the... No, just call them injunctions. Those are all the don't messages. Don't be you, don't be a girl, don't be well, don't be ill, don't be a child, don't be a grown-up, don't, don't, just don't do anything. The one that always resonated with me and it kind of shocked me was the don't exist. That's a hard one to even read. Yeah, there's some TA theorists that believe that don't exist is at the bottom of everybody's script. Yeah. Especially if you link it with, and this isn't a TA therapist, uh, I was thinking of Irvin Yalom's ideas, and many therapists actually, especially existential therapists, who believe, you know, from the day we're born, we, we're dealing with death anxiety. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, if we're talking about don't exist injunctions, it's the child that very early on, uh, almost at a non verbal level, um, decides that, you know, under you know that living is pretty shit yeah and so therefore if i do this this and this which are the driver behaviors um i can get on with life get some recognition but underneath that adaptation are the feelings that accompany the person in terms of existence like worthlessness hopelessness dread futility all those feelings so instead of feeling those they um adapt driver behavior yeah 
So there's a point to us having driver behaviours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, defences. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're defences. Yeah. But like all the other defences we have psychologically, they're very, very important because without these psychological defence systems, we'd have to then really feel the pain, the trauma, you know, the difficulties and hurts from our childhood. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with psychotherapy that I love is, you know, even the things that we don't like, they, there's a point to them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these what you're talking about here, what we're talking about, sorry, driver behaviour, which comes from transaction analysis, um, they are defences. Yeah. They're really very important to remember that. And they're defences against us feeling really terrible, futility, hopelessness, neglect, trauma, all those feelings we don't want to feel. So if we, so if we follow the, the behaviours that our parents actually give us recognition from, then we'll get on in life. Yeah. And for me, that's usually when I notice my driver behaviours more so than other times is when, when I'm tired, when I'm not feeling well, when something's going on, you know, behind the scenes that nobody knows about type of thing. That's when I, I notice that I'm in my be strong or be perfect. Mm. And under stress, our level of intensity around those behaviours become more evident. Yeah. And you see, it, for me, I know I talk personally on these podcasts because I, I do tend to share my stuff. It, it's, a, it's a good way of avoiding things if I'm in my driver behaviour, particularly when I'm aware that I'm in it. I just do lots of stuff. I just get busy and do lots of stuff. And I know <laughs> that that's me avoiding something, whatever that is. <laughs> Use the feelings. Yes, definitely, 100%. I'm a thinker and a doer. I don't do feelings. Yeah, when you defend against the feelings, then under acute stress, sometimes maybe you might feel them. But I suspect the defences are quite strong, as in most people. Um, then we, we don't have to feel those feelings. Um, now, for a therapist needs to honour those defence systems and uh, work with them to get at what's underneath. Yeah. Not to you know, persuade or or give permission for the client to, you know, take them down, for example. So it, it, you work with the defences to get to the um, feelings which drive the person in some ways to put to have these defences in the first place. So any, any therapist, hopefully, would work with the defence systems to get at what's underneath. When you're talking about the, the defence systems and getting underneath, you're talking about the injunctions. There's, for anybody that no, does... I'm talking about the drive. <laughs> oh, yes, sorry. Just, just quickly, I'm talking about working with the drivers, which I see as the defences, to get to what's underneath the defences, which is usually the real person's feelings. Yeah, because anybody that works with TA will probably know what I'm talking about. I haven't actually got a picture of it. The, the picture of the drowning man with the oh, yeah, yeah. balloons that hold up. Yeah. yeah. What One of the things I think that a lot of the time we can do is to work on the drivers, which basically is cutting off one of the balloons so that the injunctions that are bricks on the feet kind of weigh heavier and we go under a bit. Mm. Am I right in saying that? So we, we don't want to get our clients to not use the driver behavior because it is there as a defense mechanism it's, it's doing something for them if we go underneath it and look at the injunctions and the don't exist don't be you and work on that in therapy then we don't need the driver behavior as much yeah yes i know that diagram you're talking about where it's a man sort of uh, in the sea of life if you like and holding up five balloons which symbolize the five set of drivers yeah please me try hard you know um hurry up be perfect be strong and attached under the water with all these injunctions we're talking about or yeah. negative negative processes which we non-verbally take on from our parents and you're absolutely right the therapist needs to work with the defense systems and make sure that those you know, that balloon, if you like, which are the defence systems, aren't cut. Yeah. That keeps 
the person still buoyant, if you like. Um, and then at the same time, work with the process and underneath the balloons, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, because if somebody, you know, has got a be strong driver and we're constantly working on them and, and encouraging them to, you know, to not be strong and to show their feelings and to be vulnerable and all that sort of stuff, it's probably going to, you know, causes a client to be more anxious and more stressed and it's it's the wrong way of doing it it's back to front somehow for me yeah so if we talk about the you're absolutely right in terms of treatment and if we talk about being strong a driver behavior particularly um then that's that's the um you know the command or what or the um what comes from the parents that the child gets stroke for? Yeah. So by being strong, they get stroked by the parents, and therefore they carry that out as a way of hopefully getting recognition in the present or the future, rather than feeling the feelings of what's underneath the being strong command. So being strong means putting on a, basically look at it this way, putting on armour and being Mr. Teflon yeah, and just Love carrying that. on whatever may be, I will just carry on in life. People can throw whatever they like at me. I will just carry on whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Stoic Mr. is one word that always comes to mind when I think of somebody with a B strong. You sort your own counsel out we don't really talk about things with other people until after the fact and then we might talk about it <laughs> yeah i often think uh men particularly here yeah yeah i'm not saying the female gender doesn't have they don't have to be strong particularly but i think the male culture um you know uh, is often fed down to men boys really early boys don't cry and yeah. Or my little soldier, um, whatever phrases we want to pick or parental slogans. I think boys get this um, command, if you like, a lot earlier and decide a lot earlier. Um, uh, it's a sort of a really common um, command for little boys to get strokes from their parents for. Yeah. Strong and uh keep the feelings at, at bay and don't feel them and just carry on and be my little soldier throughout life and i think you know boys get these messages uh more intensely than females yeah and oh you know the being strongs if you want to look at it this way behaviors are very evident uh, like uh, uh, for boys early on, for many many boys, and boarding schools, as I said earlier on, are the f are just simply an extension of the same culture. Yeah, yeah, totally. And you know, people with a be strong driver often don't show emotion. There's not a lot of facial expressions that go oh. along with it if somebody's in that driver, and the body language can be quite closed. You know, with their arms folded and, and things which again I think a lot of men do do you know it's it's kind of inbuilt in women that we we talk about things men often being the hunter-gatherer type if there's a problem they find a solution that's it we don't need to talk about it that's the problem here's the solution crack on and do it there's a lot of stereotypes that kind of go along with that mm -hmm. certainly don't express feelings yeah yeah and so you can get people, let's take, we'll talk about men. We get a lot of men may come into therapy if, um, for lots of different reasons. If they've got a very big defense system around being strong at, at costs of everything else, then it takes a lot for them to come into therapy because mm -hmm. they fear, fear being vulnerable. And they also are going against their parent or significant other people's um, command. Yeah. Psychologically. And, and that's difficult. Mm. Yeah. And 2022, um, 
I started being a therapist in 1985, but now in 2022, and you see many more men coming to therapy. And I think that's because therapy has become more popular, it's more accessible, and they, they are more likely to come now to look at problems. And still, if the person's got a very B strong defense, um, they fear vulnerability. Yeah. And it's quite difficult for them. It, it is. And, you know, if, if, if there are any men out there listening to this, whether they're therapists or counsellors or just, you know, wanting to know a little bit more about it, I always say to all my clients that, you know, we can't be vulnerable without being courageous. And it takes an awful lot of courage to take that first step to contacting a therapist and to having therapy. I think vulnerability and courage come together. They always do. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. It takes a lot of courage for men and women who have solid defence systems about being strong um, to come to therapy in the first place. Yeah. And as I say, they have a great fear of vulnerability. And often in childhood, especially boys, I think, again, ashamed if they don't uh be if they're not being strong or if they're not being the uh big man or the macho character so expressing feelings for them uh, is quite difficult because they didn't get that recognition in childhood yeah so they decided that being strong was how they would it's like oxygen how they would survive yeah do you think that's changing Psychotherapy is much more accessible, more popular, but culturally, is that changing, being passed down to boys? Yes, I do think so, bit by bit. It's still very much, um, still a parental slogan that is passed down a lot, I think. But I do, I do think that um, bit by bit, the, uh, there's more permissions for the little boy to express feelings than there was oh. generations ago. The little boy, maybe not the older one, because we we still hear those phrases like you know being in touch with your feminine side. If you you know if you're sensitive or the, having the snowflake generation, evidently you know 2020 is creating the snowflake generation where yeah they're all soft and melt and all those. I've never heard that phrase. Have you not? No. Yes, that. Whereas it's all over social media, it was, you know, I don't know, I suppose because when we were going through COVID and, you know, we couldn't go out and people were struggling with it, there were a lot of people saying, oh, it's the snowflake generation. And, you know, when we were in the war, we, we, you know, didn't have television and we couldn't sit and play games and that, oh. that you've either got to be strong or you're a snowflake. There's oh, no middle like ground a, to it. Oh, Jackie. So it's like a derogatory sentence. Yes, yeah, totally, totally, yeah. That you know oh. that we're bringing up soft people now. We're, oh, so because, expressing feelings is a yeah. oh, it's being a snowflake, which is a derogatory um, sentence construction. Yeah, yeah, and you know, if I suppose for most people, if you're going to be described as either a strong or a snowflake, you're going to go for the strong one because there's a lot more positive connotations with that than what there is for somebody that's sensitive or in touch with the feminine side. Mm. Well, I've never heard that frame, but uh, I'm sure it's it's all over the internet. It's a shame, really, because I think that the, the question was, do I think it's becoming more popular for men to come to therapy? Yes. Yeah. Is it, you know, is the intensity of the be strong message lessened more by significant other people and parents? I don't know. It'd be good research to do. Yeah. I think we like labeling people as well. We do well, like we to categorize think, um, people. <laughs> yeah, define people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and define men as in a certain way. Um, I wouldn't like to see, but certainly I see more men in therapy in this generation than before, even though there's a cultural norm, I think, for men to be strong. So what we need to do if we're working with the drivers in the therapy room is is look at the 
the decisions that were made early on and how that's impacting on them in everyday life now? Because I, I quite like some of my driver behaviour. I, I don't want to get rid of everything. I don't think it's about getting rid of driver behaviours. I think it's about looking at vulnerability, shame, um, underneath the, the, the process. And if it's not causing any difficulty, these driver's behaviours, say in relationships or life, we won't necessarily see these people that want to uh, look at this. But, you know, people come with, for example, intimacy issues, yeah. uh, where they feel, they feel vulnerable if they're sharing or expressing parts of themselves. That might be because they've decided they have to be strong because that's what was modeled to them or passed down to them years ago. Yeah. So they carry on like a little soldier. They carry on being, you know, a strong person, which was recommended to them or passed down to them by their significant others and they got recognition from. Um, however, when they're in relationships, if they continue to be stoic and shut down and being strong when actually they want to have perhaps at some level more intimacy, uh, that might bring problems in relationships or communication breakdowns. And they may come to therapy to explore that. Yeah. And again, you know, in relationships, some of these driver behaviours work quite well together and some don't. If you've got to be strong or to please others that are in a relationship, you know, and they're both trying to please each other or you've got two try hards where they're both trying really, really hard all the time, they, it, it just highlights some stresses within the relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And usually somebody's got to say be strong driver behavior. They may they may find it that process attractive with other women or men or, or partners that have the same driver behavior. However, I think they tend to, to um, look for other people who can do the emotional housework for them. Yeah. In other words, that with different adaptations. That's a lovely phrase. I like that. The emotional housework for them. Mm. Yeah. yeah because that's the that's what happens to people like the men who carry on with this be strong because they fear being vulnerable and fear yeah. expressing emotions because they're psychological processes. Then they may find women who can express emotions for them. And that's what I mean by doing the emotional housework. Yeah, I love that. So people that have got to be strong, I'm, I'm looking at my me, me books here, what I always get out. I, I usually um, antisocial or, or charming manipulators. That's that's one of the ones that it's connected to or the creative daydreamer and schizoid. So, so are you saying that people who have a lot of intensity on be strong defense systems will be attracted to people who are withdrawn or schizoid by character? Well, those are the ones that the primary drivers are connected to. Yeah. So it's somebody with a, a B strong driver might go with somebody that's um, an enthusiastic overreactor or histrionic. Those two would go quite well. Well, that makes sense because somebody yeah. is histrionic, you know, if we're talking about the nickname of enthusiastic reactor, uh, they're, they're going to be with people people that um, have got stroked for actually, you know, um, expressing emotions easily, and they express emotions easily. Yeah. So it, it doesn't surprise me that somebody who's got the intensity of a be strong would be attracted to people who could do the emotional housework for them. Yeah. That makes perfect much, much sense. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a minefield in, in all of this, as always, with anything working with the, the mind and psychotherapy. Yeah, and I just want to repeat again. If I, if I had to do some research on couples therapy, and I haven't had any research on couples therapy, but I'd like to do now and talk on this podcast, I think that you would find that probably one of the major reasons why people well couples come to therapies because communication breaks down yeah and usually quite often it breaks down because somebody and usually the man 
is sticking intensely to their being strong behaviors and not allowing the their partner in not only allowing them to um express feelings with them or uh so intimacy gets threatened and and often by being strong and closed off they start to realize um often by the um impact and feedback from their partner that things aren't going particularly well in the relationship yeah so they want to keep the relationship going and at some levels do want some intimacy but they don't know how to let down their defenses and that's often one of the major issues or dynamics that couples come to therapy for yeah that's it and you know on the surface level it's all around communication but the the more we go down and down and down the driver behavior and the injunctions are usually well it's always in there somewhere yeah and another another um example i would like to say is when people have children mm. and often the male doesn't want to pass down that be strong process to yeah. their child because they want the boy or girl to have a different experience to them uh, so that often brings yeah the person to be into a process where they want to change their be strong driving. i think having children shines a light on most things really yeah we don't want the cycle to carry on mm. yeah because mm. a so, lot of this is kind of like i know there was a phrase used in my training it's like a hot potato we just pass it on whatever we're doing we be, you know if we don't know any different we don't know how to be any different we just pass it on through the generations yeah, i'm sure exactly. a lot of the stuff i have doesn't actually belong to me it belongs to somebody else further up the line that's right and that's therapy has become more popular and accessible in 2022 from when i started out in 1985 more and more people see therapy or stroke counseling as a way to talk about these issues. Yeah. I think people have got very intense, be strong drivers. I applaud them for coming to therapy. Me too, 100%. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, in the therapy room and with trust and all those sorts of things, if, if they're like, you know, stoic and stand alone and I don't need anybody, for them to, to share certain things in the therapy room, it's it is showing an immense amount of courage and vulnerability all rolled into one that's right and i, I think the therapist needs to have a quality of patience yeah and an understanding of the defense system of being strong and what's underneath that um to help them with the, this treatment yeah it's usually um about in transactionality terms finding the youngest child and the vulnerable child which has been yeah uh hidden if you like or protected is the odd word here but covered up by yes. the strong driver so until the next one bob where we're going to be looking at please others and hurry up we're going to do a double whammy for the next one. Oh, we're going to two two more drivers Two more, two squashed into one. Oh, great, great, good. So I look forward I to that. See bye you bye. on the next one. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.